morning. Welcome to In the Light, our contemporary service here at First Presbyterian. We're so glad you could join us and that we can worship God together this morning. We're going to open with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the second Sunday of Advent. And thank you for another morning that we can come together and praise you. We ask that you be in this space and that you hear our songs and our message this morning. This is all for you, Lord. Lead us closer to you, God, and make us more like you each day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, this is our hanging of the green service, so it's going to be a little bit different than our past ones. Um, so we're going to go over one of the decorations, do scripture, do a story, um, and then there will be some songs in between. Um, we don't have the guitar today. We will be um, performing with karaoke versions on YouTube. So I apologize in advance for any technical difficulties, but it was running well this morning. All right, we are going to now do our um, yeah, uh, prayer of confession. <laughs> All right, we'll say this together. Holy God, we aspire to love and trust you, but so often we get in the way of ourselves. We see only the deep sadness of the world and do not notice your people at work amid the sorrow. We assume that things will never get better and do not see all that is good right now. We close our eyes and complain about darkness rather than see the light that shines all around us. Help us, Holy One. Help us to grow in love and trust and compassion and hope, so that as the Christ child comes to us once again, we will see him and know him and rejoice. Amen. Now for a moment of personal silent confession. As the water of baptism flows, hear this good news. God loves you, and wrapped in that love is grace and forgiveness, and a call to go out into the world with that love. Thanks be to God. Amen. All right, this is the significance of the holly and the ivy. Uh, the reading comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was a governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. God's gift to us of Christ is ever new, ever eternal. Early Christians were wore holly as they entered the church. It was their belief that the burning bush through which God spoke to Moses was a holly or holy tree. Many believe that Christ's crown of thorns were fashioned from holly leaves and branches, and that as the crown was placed pressed on his head, his blood turned to white berries to red berries we see today. Ivy, too, is rich in symbolism. In the Middle Ages, ivy was used for decorating. It was considered to be a symbol of love because of its clinging habit of growth. Holly and ivy have been linked together because of holly's sturdiness and ivy's tenaciousness. Both have an incredible ability to survive and grow. They celebrate Jesus who offers us life beyond death.
Next is the significance of the Christmas angels. Uh, this reading comes from Luke chapter 2, uh, verses 8 through 14. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord sh uh, shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. On the day, Christ was born in the stable at Bethlehem as planned. The Christmas angels first appeared to the shepherds, and the trumpeting angel friends played the first few notes of the glorious concert in the dark night sky. Shepherds looked up to the sky and were shocked, surprised, and awed, soon to be filled with amazement and wonder, and their hearts brimmed with humility and thankfulness to God for his glory. The angels then gave the shepherds the good tidings of great joy and were joined by many other angels who sang and praised God filling the skies with the angelic words, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill to men. This is why we place angels on our trees and around our houses. Oh, mm -hmm. 
scripture reading. The scripture reading for the Christmas tree comes from Hosea 14. Like a cedar of Lebanon, he will send down his roots, his young shoots will grow, his splendor will be like the olive tree, his fragrance like a cedar of Lebanon. People will dwell in his shade, he will flourish, they will flourish like the grain, they will blossom like the vine. Israel's fame will be like the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim, what more have I to do with idols? I will answer him and care for him. I am a flourishing juniper. Your fruitfulness comes from me. The story of the Christmas tree is an old one from Martin Luther, the great reformer. And he was walking in the woods in Germany on a starry night. And he just was overwhelmed with the grandeur of the beauty of all that God had created. He was thinking of the psalmist and thinking of the way that God had placed the stars so beautifully in the vault of heaven. And all he could think of was he wanted to bring that home and put it in his home. So he cut down one of the evergreen trees because the evergreen tree, by nature of its shape, points to heaven. By its evergreen is the eternal, like our heavenly creator, father. And he brought it into the house, and to recreate the stars, he lighted candles on all the branches. And that became the Christmas tree. And of course, today, we have all kinds of varieties of Christmas trees. But it was his idea to bring that beauty of creation, the eternalness of evergreen, and the stars that God created into his home to remind him of that grandeur that touched him so deeply that night. Next is the significance of the Christmas rose. This reading comes from Isaiah chapter 35, verses 1 through 7. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will, give it, will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon, they will see the glory of the Lord. The splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf, un deaf unstopped. Then will the lame weep like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs, and the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. This is a favorite Advent verse. The desert will rejoice and bloom everywhere. It's also a wonderful statement of our glorious anticipation of the birth of Jesus. Isaiah's rose was probably a crocus. Crocus? Crocus. But any colorful flower is fine. Here is the legend of the Christmas rose. On the cold December night, everybody was coming to see their new savior and brought him all kinds of gifts and presents. The three wise men came in with their valuable gifts of myrrh, frankincense, and gold and offered them to baby Jesus. At that point of time, a shepherd maiden who had come to see and visit the Christ child also reached the door of the stable. However, she was very poor and had nothing to offer the child. She felt helpless and was quietly weeping outside the door. She had searched for flowers all over the countryside, but there was not even a single bloom to be found in the bitter winters. An angel outside the door was watching over her and knew about her fruitless search. He took pity on her, and when he saw her head droop down in sorrow, gently brushed aside the snow at her feet from where a beautiful cluster of waxen white winter roses sprang up with pink-tipped petals. 
There he softly whispered in the shepherd, yeah, the shepherdess's ears that these Christmas roses are more valuable than any myrrh, frankincense, or gold, for they are pure and made of love. The maiden was pleasantly surprised when she heard those words and joyfully gathered the flowers and offered them to the holy infant. Uh, next, this song, Emily and I actually sang when I was probably a freshman in high school. She has no recollection of this. She does not remember this. Um, it's just like the famous, I heard a chord, you know, David plays secret chord, Hallelujah song, except it plays, you know, the story of the birth of Jesus. So.
Next up is the significance of the bells. This comes from John chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Bells have been used throughout the centuries to call people to worship or to bring them news. When royal heirs to the throne were born in European countries, bells would peal forth the joy. When wars were over, bells would ring in celebration. Bells have also rung when people died. They told. Today they ring to call us to remember the birth of Jesus, the King's heir, our Lord and Christ. When Longfellow penned the words to his poem, that is the basis for the hymn, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. America was still months away from Lee's surrender to Grant at Parliament Fox Courthouse on April 9, 1865. And his poem reflected the prior years of the war's despair, while ending with a confident hope of triumphant peace. Peter, uh, verse, or chapter 3, verse 4. 
Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. Dr. Jewel Poinsett, who was the first ambassador to Mexico, brought the red, bright red star-shaped flower to the United States. Hence, it was named Poinsettia. It is also known as flame leaf, or flower of the holy night. The legend related to this favorite Christmas flower is Mexican, too. It involves a brother and sister who do not have money to give at church in honor of the baby Jesus. Instead, they sadly picked weeds to line his crib. But when other children teased them, the weeds sprouted into the beautiful star-shaped red flowers we know so well. I always save the best for last and the significance stories. You're familiar with all the words of institution when I do, but I've always been touched by the rich symbolism that Jesus uses at the table. And it's intentional on his part because I know he truly wanted people to remember what he did. Granted, there were people that would write things down, but he wanted things to stick in their hearts and resonate with them long after that Thursday evening, just before he was arrested, and then the next day when he was crucified, and all of the post-resurrection appearance stories. We know that he took the cup, which was the final cup of the Passover meal, and the Passover would have been deeply ingrained into the followers' minds and hearts. We all know the story from the Exodus. We know that the people had been saved from death. Pharaoh had threatened to kill all the firstborn Hebrew children because Moses had told him that the firstborn Egypt children would be killed. And that was the final plague. Well, they all died, but the angel of death passed over all of the Hebrew houses because blood from a sacrificial lamb was spread over the doors. That blood, sacrificial lamb, is equivalent to our Jesus, the sacrifice for our sins, and death, the ultimate enemy of each of us. But there's another image that often gets neglected in preaching and teaching. And that is that the cup is also a symbol of the Jewish engagement. And I love this, probably because I'm a girl and a romantic, but I love the fact that some of the wording that Jesus uses is not a coincidence. This cup I give you, this cup of the new covenant, that's actually wording from the Jewish engagement service. And the groom would actually take a cup of wine and he would offer it to his bride-to-be. And this was a very serious contract. And it was a covenant. And it was really equivalent to a marriage. You had to get a divorce to set aside an engagement. And you know this if you read carefully the Christmas story, because when Joseph finds out that Mary's pregnant, and he knows he didn't do it, he decides, okay, I'm gonna divorce her quietly, because they're only engaged at that point. But engaged means she can live at his family home with him, she can be a part of everything. And nobody really would have thought anything if it was his baby. All of those complications go with the engagement. But 
it would have required a divorce. It's a mess. But what I want you to notice is Jesus uses the wording of relationship, of commitment. He offers them the cup in that sense of take this cup and drink from it. And what would happen with the bride and the groom is he would offer the cup of wine, and if she accepted it and drank from it, the covenant was formed. The relationship was begun. And he would go and prepare to have a home. He would work. He would, they would move in basically with his parents, and then he would go off and prepare a place. Part of Jesus' wording in John 14 is, I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again. And it's all tied together in a beautiful, intimate way. And it's so special because we have that relationship with Christ. And it's all tied up in the cup of the covenant. So today, as we take communion, as we remember Christ's body broken for us on the cross, given freely to us to remember I want us also to remember the Passover, the lamb that Christ is that sacrificed for us. I also want us to remember that we are committed to him and that he is committed to us. He claims us in the waters of baptism, but also in this covenantal cup. We belong to him. Our Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he also took the cup. And as he poured, he said, this cup is the new covenant. Sealed with my blood. This do you as often as you drink. In remembrance of me. Dear beloved family of God, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Loving Lord, set apart these elements from all common use for this sacred use. Help us to remember how closely we belong to you, tied by this bread and by this cup, intimately yours, your children, in covenant relationship. In Jesus' name, amen. I would ask for two elders to come forward and serve. <clears throat> you may come forward. I should have explained. It's in tension. Take a piece of bread, dip in a cup. <laughs> get another piece of bread if you no, didn't get to. You just want to tell It's my fault. <laughs> Seriously. I had a funeral and a dance last night, and a weather crunch came in, so I didn't pay. I apologize.
We do have one last song. Before that, we're going to close in prayer. Does anyone have any requests or praises? Okay. Oh, yes. Church nanny died last Sunday. Yes. Our yes. beloved Virginia colleague. I have a prayer request. My husband's dad got attacked by his own dog, oh, and he has a lot of stitches on his hands, and he needs mm -hmm. healing as well as a soul healer. Any others? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we lift these prayers to you. Please watch over everyone who loved the church nanny, and please watch over Kenny's dad. Let him heal physically, also spiritually. We thank you for being here today. Thank you for allowing us to worship together. Thank you for the music. Thank you for just being in this space with us. Be with us this week as we walk in your way. In your name we pray. Amen.
Thank you so much for coming. If you want a donut, please take them. Yes, take yeah. donuts. Take them. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm all alone at home. I can't eat all this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I can, but I, should, I, I don't need it. Well, let's all stand. Well, Father, we're glad that you could be here today uh, as we get our minds focused on your coming and your saving us. And we are so grateful that you are God Emmanuel, that you're here with us today. So, Father God, I ask a blessing on each and every one here, uh, that we would be reminded that you've come to lift our burdens, to come to heal our diseases, and to come to fix whatever was broken. And we thank you for that. So a blessing on each person as we go for this week.